All right, pianist Lawrence Hobgood is here to play some tunes and talk to us about his role as musical director to some of the biggest names in jazz. Plus, new music in the five spot, and because it's Film Friday, we'll be looking at jazz musicians who had starring roles in feature films. I'm Brian Zimmerman. Welcome to the Jazz is Happy Hour. All right, and before we get into today's programming, let me quickly mention an ECM album that I think you'll really enjoy. It is by accordionist Jean-Louis Matinier and guitarist Kevin Siddiqui. It's called Rivage. It's a very nice duo album. It has that left bank, rive gauche, chanson feel about it. You know, you pour yourself a glass of wine, you go sit out on the terrace in the afternoon with a nice book or some good company. And yes, this is the perfect soundtrack for that. Uh, you can check it out yourself at ecmrecords.com. Um, let me also remind you that our summer 2020 issue is available now, as in right now. It is all about fusion. There's Chick Corea on the cover there. Um, we've got uh, some essential fusion albums, conversations with young fusion artists. It's a really great issue, and I'm really proud of it. Um, for those of you who want to start reading it right away, good news, you can. It's on our website. We have converted all that print content into digital content. You will need a digital subscription, but we're offering a special subscription rate to Happy Hour viewers right now. For 99 cents per month, for three months, you'll receive unlimited digital access, plus we'll enroll you to receive our upcoming print issue that's coming out in September, the fall 2020 issue, which is all about the art of the album listening to albums, producing albums, collecting albums, album cover art. It's really cool. So you get all this digital content online right when you subscribe. Plus, come September, you'll get this beautiful 100-page print issue in your mailbox. Um, all right. With that, let us uh, welcome you to the show. It is Friday, May 29th. Good afternoon. Let me remind you again, this is the last time we'll be doing the happy hour at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Okay, starting Monday, June 1st, we will be moving into the 8.30 p.m. Eastern time slot. We heard from you, and we know that you're all night owls, and we want to keep this party going late into the evening, and that is cool with us. So Monday, June 1st, 8.30 p.m., mark your calendars. We're going to be kicking off that time slot with bassist Esperanza Spalding. Should be really cool. All right, my guest today is uh, Grammy-nominated pianist Lawrence Hobgood. Uh, under his own name and with his trio, he's put out a bunch of really great albums, including most recently Tessa Terra, on which he covers songs by The Beatles, The Police, Glenn Campbell, uh, Crosby, Stills, Young, and Nash. He's also been nominated and won some Grammys for his work as musical director and producer on albums featuring Kurt Elling. Um, we've also got some new music in the five spot. And because, like I said, it is Film Friday, online editor Matt Micucci is here to share five times jazz musicians acted in movies and actually did a pretty good job. All right. So without further ado, let's go ahead and bring in today's very special guest, Mr. Lawrence Hobgood. Hey, Brian. Hey, Lawrence. How you doing, man? Uh, under the circumstances, quite well. Well, you look good, man. I was hoping you'd wear a real sharp pair of glasses, and uh, you didn't disappoint, my friend. Oh, well, you know, the glasses. Always looking the part, man. Always looking the part. Hey, I want to start right off the bat, um, talking about the new album, Tessa Terra, which is great. Um, you know, you are known historically for your wonderful interpretations of the Great American Songbook. You had that project with Kurt, uh, 1619 Broadway, the Brill Building Project. Um, but for the new album, you kind of move the focus upwards along the timeline i mean you've got uh what is it sweet judy blue eyes in there uh you've got blackbird by the beatles we shall overcome wichita lineman um and they're all fantastic really imaginative covers what made you uh again want to kind of tick up the timeline a little bit for your latest album well it was really a combination of things the record that i made with kurt elling that won a grammy was the live at lincoln center coltrane hartman yeah. project where I did a lot of writing for string quartet and basically right. fell back in love with writing for string quartet, which it had been years since I'd done in college. And I really wanted to explore a project with just the trio and the string quartet. And if, you know, just to say it, no singers involved, just instrumental. Yeah. Um, and uh, so then when it came to the repertoire, um, that was just where I felt that direction going, which is this issue of bringing um, more contemporary popular song 
into the jazz canon yeah. somehow. Uh, and also, I should just say, uh, very important in my mind to connect project to project. And my next project, which is going to be for a much more traditional jazz instrumentation, classic sextet mm -hmm. instrumentation oh, cool. uh, with tenor, alto, and trumpet and, and trio rhythm section, um, that project is going to be all original writing. Nice. Cool. So I wanted back to back projects to, to show both sides of what I'm into as a composer arranger. Um, because to me, the difference between those two things is a lot more misunderstood and a lot less of there really being a difference than most people uh, think of it. So all those things played into it. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's great that you're, you know, obviously your albums are very conceptual you know, front to back, but it's great to hear you say that even, you know, the succession of albums has some, co you know, conceptual through line, you know, so that's something I've always admired about you, man. And yeah, with the string arranging on this new album is just brilliant. This is not your typical with strings albums, you know, where it's just synth beds or something like that, whole notes as you play over it, you weave these arrangements brilliantly into the tunes. Um, really involved string arrangements. I'm thinking of Sweet Judy Blue Eyes where you, you play just this rippling run and you have the strings do it right after. It, it's incredible. Um, that and, one was uh, interesting. I'll just tell you that that when I tackled that one, I, there was no there was no way to do it half-baked, you know? Yeah, right. Uh, and it is a sweet in form movements. The original Crosby, Stills, Nash version is. And so I had to do the whole thing. I really wanted to do it, but I was like, man, this is good. And it turned out being a solid month of writing about eight hours a day to write that around. Wow. Wow. Well, it shows, man, because it's, it's a beautiful tune. Um, the whole album, really. Uh, yeah, I encourage you. people listening, check out Tessa Terra, uh, Lawrence Hobgood's latest album. It is excellent. Lawrence Hobgood, you are seated at a piano, man. I am. And uh, I'm sure people don't want to hear me continue to blather on. Um, so I would love to hear you play a tune, man, if at all possible. Well, since we were just talking about it, why don't I do a little brief uh, treatment of uh, one of the songs from the record? Oh, that'd be awesome. And what uh, what piano is this, by the way? Oh, yes. This is a Yamaha <laughs> N3X. Uh, I'm very proud to be a Yamaha artist. They are an absolutely fantastic, uh, supportive um, company for all of their artists. And uh, uh, I sold my piano of a different brand in order to get this um this is a their premium digital hybrid so in a nutshell the action is the keyboard and the action the mechanism of physically uh, having what normally results in a hammer striking a string is a concert grand action but instead of a hammer there's a sensor that trig triggers the digital hat so this is a digital piano and it's just uh i love it i'll leave it at that very cool. Um, so I think people will recognize this, so I'm not, I'm not going to give it away.
little Wichita lineman. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, gorgeous. And yeah, I mean, Lawrence, to hear what you did with the string treatment on the new album um, is just brilliant. It's just brilliant. So again, people listening, go check out Lawrence's new album, Test of Terror. It came out 2018, right? Or 2019, 2019 last year. Yeah. That's, That's right. Last That's year. right. About a year Very ago cool. right now, actually. Cool. Lawrence, we are talking to you. You are in New York where mm -hmm. you've been for how many years? Since 2006. Okay. Okay. 2006. So yeah, yeah, you can call yourself a New Yorker, but you lived for a long time in Chicago. Okay. Um, as did I. Well, I was only there for like four or five years. Um, but some of my fondest memories as a musician, as a writer, uh, were in Chicago. I love the scene, man. Do you miss it? I miss many parts of it. Uh, yeah. I will I will be completely candid and tell you that I am not a natural flatlander. <laughs> but I spent the, the majority of my life years there because my dad was a professor at University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and then I wound up in Chicago. Right. But um, it finally got to the point where I needed some hills. I needed some elevation. And, some and you know, there's actually yeah. a, an amazing amount of that very close by in New York. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. But I miss, oh, God, my friends, the Green Mill. Yeah, Green I was going to ask you about when the scene when you were there, you know, what were some of the venues? You know, who were some of the cats you were playing with? What was it like? This would have been what? What era well, was I this? I moved there in 88. 80, okay. And fell into playing at the mill. Uh, one of my favorite uh, reminiscent anecdotes uh, is that I ended up with a steady gig at the mill, and I hadn't even lived in Chicago for a week yet. Wow. And this, for people watch, this is the Green Mill. This is an iconic Chicago jazz club in the uptown neighborhood. Very, think Al Capone. You know, I think Al Capone used to have a regular booth there. It's one of my favorite venues in the world. Yeah, it, it's, it really, there is no other place like it in the yeah. world. Uh, I'm supposed to do my annual weekend there, uh, October 16th, I think. Um, and, you know, knocking on wood that that actually happens. Yeah, uh, there are people who sometimes it's usually a combination of the draw of the mill. And there's a, a number of people, a, a surprising number of people have never been to Chicago and they've all heard great things about Chicago. And they, they'll plan a vacation to just spend some time and check out this great city in combination with a particular weekend uh, that they want to check out at the Green Mill. And they call it a milgrimage. <laughs> awesome. Sign me up, man. I'd be down for a milgrimage. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was in Chicago, of course, that you linked up with Kurt, you know, back in the mm -hmm. day and when we go on to a slew of albums. When did you first meet Kurt and what clicked back then? Uh, I met Kurt. Uh, uh, he sat in on a gig that I was part of that happened every Monday at the Green Mill with nice. the great saxophonist Ed Peterson. Sure. Um, who actually plays on, I think, the first two records a little bit um, that, that we made for Blue Note. Okay. Uh, back in that time. Um, and uh, we just, I think, I think the, the, the best way to say it is that, that we had, we were an example of an effective collaborative team mm -hmm. because we brought such different, totally different skill sets to the table. There was, there was very little redundancy uh, right. in terms of immediate application. And yet we, we had, you know, a lot in common. We both came from, um, uh literate uh academic ish back right yeah his mother or father was a, a poetry teacher a literature no, his professor father was actually a church organist oh wow Kapellmeister. Um, okay uh, wow uh, ch a church organist and choir director but but there was a heavy um there was just a heavy and of course a lot of that was because of just of just him you know right he he ended up going to divinity school and right was, right was a very well read philosophical individual. Whereas my upbringing, my father was a pretty famous uh, theater teacher, and I had grown up uh, with with the arts. My mom was an Appalachian folk artist, mm -hmm. and uh, the arts were ever present, mm -hmm. including all kinds of music that you can name. So, wow. uh, but I was the 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 composer uh theoretician if you will who also right. played uh at an, an acceptable level and <laughs> um and he had the voice 
And so uh, it was a, a, at that time, it was a natural, uh, natural partnership. Very cool. Yeah, no, it's interesting to hear you mention the Appalachian that your mother was an you know Appalachian folk artist, and mm -hmm. because the folk music of that region, oh man, it's so melodic. You know, it it has what is what is the phrase that one of my favorite writers, uh, William Zinser, uses? Instantly learned, never forgotten. Those kind wow. of melodies. You know, yeah. just simplistic but yeah. profoundly simplistic, yeah. and. I imagine that as a soundtrack to your life growing up, you know, kind of set uh, the standard for appreciation for melody, you know, and appreciation for sound structures. And mm -hmm. um, oh, absolutely. And and there was a time I did a series of records for a British audiophile label called Name N A I M, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I always put some Appalachian song on cool each one of those records and at some point i'd like to do a whole appalachian record similar in general concept to tessa terra because there's one of my general beliefs is that we have all these different categories for music but it's really kind of silly and this is mirrored mm -hmm. in society we yeah we have so much more in common right than what separates us Right. And we let we let people play with the wedge issues and try to distract us from the fact that we're all we're all mostly the same. And music is the same way, you know, uh, totally rhythm, uh, 12, 12 tone Western based pitching system. That's ninety nine point nine percent of the music that 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 people listen to. Um, and uh, so anyway the idea of using whether it's 60s pop standards or an Appalachian folk melody for an improvisational uh, approach is to me, it's a no brainer. It's totally natural. I love that, man. I, I would, I would listen to an album like that for sure. We talk about that a lot on the show is this idea of listening vertically through music instead of horizontally across genre. And you begin to see some connections, you know, stylistically throughout time from like a Stravinsky to a monk you know, to uh, Kurt Cobain, uh, you know, and and mm -hmm. using different, you know, criteria of music rather than just genre. Um, so There's a great book that I recommend to people by um, Alex Ross called okay. uh, the, the Rest is Noise, Listening to the 20th Century. Um, and some of the great stories in there, and the only reason I briefly mention it, are stories of people like Bartok and Stravinsky, um, searching for old Greek folk melodies to base right. their new, yeah, completely extrapolated, exponentially more complex piece on, but source material, libretto, you know, right, man. Um, it's really, really, really interesting. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so we'll pick up, uh, you know, kind of after your work with Kurt, because you, you collaborate with vocalists so well, and I know that is a skill unto itself as a piano player to, you know, play with a vocalist. Yeah. You have helped some uh, uh, vocalists recently realize their visions on kind of their breakout albums. I'm thinking of Ariana Nykrug mm -hmm. um, and Alicia Olatuja. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in this role, you're kind of a musical director. Um, and you mentioned up front that people don't really understand maybe the difference between composer, arranger, producer, musical director. So for an album like the one you did with Ariana Nykrug, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's her album. Um, what was your role in kind of shaping the album and bringing it to fruition? Well, Ariana is, uh, uh, unique in that she's a way more highly educated singer than most singers are in terms of theory that has roughly equal amounts uh, uh, is roughly equally attributable to the fantastic music program that she went through at University of Miami. Right. Um, uh, the dean down there is my friend Shelly Berg, who's an amazing uh, musician and a great, wonderful um, person. Uh, and the program he's built there is really good. But Ariana has a brain uh, for understanding theoretical constructs. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I first met her, she already was doing her own charts uh, uh, and arrangements of, of, of good but basic 
nature. Mm -hmm. um, so part of my, uh, the big part of my role initially was to interact to her with her. And, and again, I'm going to be really candid here. Um, uh, I'm, I'm for the most, for the most part, and I've, I'm a human being. So if somebody walked in and offered me, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, there might be a different answer. I don't think I should have to apologize for that, but given normal, uh, budgetary conditions, I'm not really interested in working with, with people that don't want to push the envelope a little uh. bit. Um, I believe in a, an ensemble philosophy where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And in order for that to happen, one of the things necessary is that the singer has to be willing to sublimate themselves a little bit to the music as a whole, the ensemble as a whole. Yeah. And uh, some singers, they might describe what I'm describing differently, but that's the way I'm describing it. Um, right. And they're, they're not interested in that. And that's fine. That's great. If they want to keep uh, cranking out uh, stuff, that's a lot more mainstream. And I think inarguably more closely resembles what's already been done in the past. That's fine. There's actually a bigger audience for that than for what I'm interested in doing to be again, candid. But um, anyway, all that to just say, Ariana was very much interested in um, uh, pushing that envelope. And uh, so we started, the way I like to work is very sort of nuts and bolts collaborative, mm -hmm. which means I want to interact in real time with the singer that I'm working with, because it gives me a chance to hear and analyze their tendencies, their proclivities, kind of where they want it to go so that I can fashion the arrangements around their natural instincts anyway. So as I'm maybe pushing them into territory they haven't been in before, it's not totally alien because it's actually sort of based on what they already cool. want to do. Yeah, cool. Uh, and you absolutely emphasize her strengths. You do push the boundaries on that album, uh, recontextualizing some standards um, in such a way that it almost kind of, kind of, flips the meaning of that right you have the one um version was it up jump spring on that album or um no, not it might as well spring. Might, as it well might, spring. Might, as, might as well be spring my, that, that's my yeah favorite yeah it really kind of yeah. pulls the melancholy aspects out of it it's very cool what you guys do um and yeah hats off to ariana fantastic vocalist and another i know i keep adding people watching i know i keep adding albums to your must listen list but put this one on it too because it's really good um lawrence i have a few more questions for you but again it would be great uh to hear you play another song would that be possible sure and because we were talking about it um i might i might play a little appalachian song um, beautiful this beautiful. is uh it, it, i was reminded of it when you said the thing about melodies being so lyrically simple and yet absolutely unforgettable um uh this is a hymn called uh, jacob's cross
Just beautiful ones. Just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for playing that. Uh, exactly one of those melodies, like uh, William Zinser says, instantly learned, never forgotten. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, as you're playing, I hear so many influences, um, you know, kind of from the Nat King Cole touch to, and and I wanted to ask because you did put, put out an album called Honor Thy Fathers. Mm -hmm. And Jack, can we pull up that album color cover? Um, which was an homage. There's the cover. That first of all, who are th those people on the album? Is well, that it, you? That or is, is indeed that's me and my father and my grandfather. Beautiful, uh, beautiful. I, I had that. That's an original. Um, it's from an original, actual. What do you you know? Old, old school silver print photograph. And oh, wow! I I didn't do everything smartly when I was younger. <laughs> but one of the smart things I did once, I, because I took that picture and I realized it was really special when I was maybe, I don't know, 19 or 20 years old. And I remember going and having it framed nicely at a frame shop in a way that uh, with, with the glass that would protect it from UV light. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it was sitting right there. In fact, it's hanging on the wall right over there. Cool, man. Hey, that was some good foresight. Yeah, it is a uh, it's a beautiful album. And again, the concept is honoring, you know, people that influenced you musically, right? And mm -hmm. yeah. And so I know Natka, you have Straighten Up and Fly Right on there. So, you know, again, I'm kind of curious as to your uh, musical or pianistic influences. Well, I I tend to always think of what I call, uh, for, for, for better or worse, I call the big four, which are uh, Herbie, right. Keith Jarrett, Chick, and McCoy. Um, okay. Beyond that, uh, Oscar was my very first love. Um, then after that, my next thing was a big Bill Evans stage. I went through when I was um, uh, you know, 19 through maybe 22. Um, then I started getting more into uh, the, the more you know, blatant modernist, if you want to say it that way. But I mean, Cedar Walton, um, uh, but but also, you know, Wynton Kelly and nice. uh, Red yeah. Garland and all all of that that uh, older Bob school, Bud Powell. I was just reading a, 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 an article about Bud Powell yesterday um, uh, and then more modern players. Um, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I have to give props to Brad Meldow. I think he's an incredible innovator and would, I'd be just stupid and lying if I said he hadn't had a, an influence on what I'm trying to think about when I play. Cool. Um, it's a very long list. Uh, it, I will say, and this is, again, I'm just being completely candid. I, um, I have a little bit of a weird paradox, at least that's the way I think of it in that I identify with Herbie's playing for reasons we don't have time to go into here but if i had to say if you had if i had to say who my favorite player is which fortunately i don't have to say that but if i had to right. <laughs> then i would play it safe and 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 go with herbie um but i know that uh, uh it's been commented on too many times to just pretend like it's not the case is that my my plan my actual my actual playing tends to remind people more of Jarrett who's been right well that's what I say. It's, it's so cool to hear you say you know people like Herbie at Cedar Walton because it's like the Ernest Hemingway thing those those influences are there but maybe under the surface not at the point of the iceberg that's on top you know you can you can absolutely and and I could you know hear you know some of the the harmonies in your left hand you know or Herbie esque and uh, kind of cut against the grain so. Um, and you know it's it's always nice to yeah point to contemporary artists like Brad uh, like Herbie and say you know they're still very much influencing the scene as are you Lawrence I mean let's let's I'll be candid this time you you've had a tremendous influence on on young players and not just piano players either but as a composer and an arranger um, yeah man you're 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 absolutely making a mark and and I can I cannot recommend this new album enough. Um, you mentioned blatant modernity, and uh, I would like kind of set off this trigger in my head. I know you played with uh, Charlie Hayden, um, you know, who was instrumental in ushering in you know, with or Ornette Coleman, kind of the modern jazz era. Um, that was a great record as well. What was it like to play with Charlie? You know, as a bassist, uh, you're the pianist. You have a bond 
you know, it's uh, when you're making music, there is indelible bond between the bass and piano. So what was it like to play with Charlie? Uh, it was almost surreally wonderful. Yeah. Um, he was warm. He was giving. Um, and uh, it's very nice of you to mention that project. Uh, that it was it was a duet record. So right. to me, I never thought I'd even get to play with Charlie Hayden, but to play duets with him and get to make a record of it. Uh, it was a real honor. Um, we had, uh, we talked on the phone about repertoire. We had a, a very relaxed sort of afternoon long rehearsal at his house. Uh, and then we recorded over two days at the, uh, at Cal Arts um, in the performance studio there. And one of the main things I remember is, you know, he was playing his uh, Vion bass, which uh, is just the, like, it's the Stradivarius of basses. Right. And um, he never traveled with that anymore, but because we were doing this in his neighborhood, he was able to play this unbelievable instrument. And uh, I remember being just very relieved that the, the, uh, the Stein, the nine foot concert Steinway uh, that was in that room had very recently been completely overhauled and rebuilt, which was the only reason that it came close to sounding as good on its merits as Charlie's bass did. Um, <laughs> uh, it was just something I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitive to sound. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, it was, it was, it was amazing. It was just, you know, I mean, it was it was that sound that you grew up with, whether listening right. to Ornette or the right. Liberation Orchestra or whatever. Uh, uh, it was that sound. And you look over and it's, it's him playing that sound and I get to play with it. It's just it was crazy. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, hey, Lawrence, this has been a pleasure for me, man, as a fan of your music um, in so many contexts. Thank you so much for being on the show. If people want to uh, check out what's going on with you, kind of follow along, what's the best place for them to do that? LawrenceHobgood.com. Okay. Uh, right there's, on. There's uh, all sorts of stuff on there. And also, um, Lawrence Hobgood Music is a Facebook okay. group or whatever you call that fan page. It's weird even using that word, but hey. <laughs> Excellent. And Tessa Terra out right now. Can they buy it on your site? I always encourage people to buy yes, the physical. Now's yes, the time to buy the physical. That. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. Yes, you can buy it on my site. Um, uh, there's a, you just go to the store link there. I did it in vinyl, I did it in double vinyl. Oh, cool. Um, because Tessa Terra, I don't know if you ever got to hear it. There's a bonus track of a Chopin waltz that I adapted, uh, to jazz right. and we didn't have room to put it on the CD. Um, but it's available if you buy the CD as a free download, there's a code on there. You can just go download it online. Um, but we did put it on the, uh, was one of the reasons we did double vinyl was so that we could fit all eight tracks um, on the two on the two discs. So that's all on there in the store. And if you if you scroll down on the homepage, there's actually I did a, I started doing a podcast. Um, oh, cool! And the, the first one is actually about Tessa Terra, so you can check that out. That's on there too. Right on. Will do, man. Hey, well, hopefully next time when this is all over and behind us, we'll be able to. Uh, I'll come by the Green Mill, uh, you know, for your run in chicago we'll end with this man when you are back in chicago you lou malnati's guy paisano's guy giordano's guy uh you know i you well i used to be a a, a gino's east a gino's guy east. when i lived there. cornmeal crust oh yeah boom yeah homemade sausage, <laughs> homemade sauce i was a gino's east guy and then i think they uh they got bought and their thing yeah. changed a little bit um so but chicago chicago pizza yeah Right on, man. Lawrence, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you so you, much for uh, chatting it. with us and playing with us. I, I really dug it. Thank you, Lawrence. You bet. Thank you. Take care, man. Okay, bye. All right. So thank you once again to Lawrence Hopgood. Absolutely a pleasure to talk with him and certainly to hear him play. Uh, before we get into the rest of the show's programming, let me uh, let you know about Blue Sound. They're an award-winning wireless high-res sound system that lets you play music in any and every room throughout your home. You choose music from your favorite streaming service or from a music library connected to your home network. Control where, at what volume, and when the music plays via a free Blue OS app for your smartphone, tablet, or uh, desktop computer. And that's it. Getting the kind of audiophile-grade sound system that every jazz fan deserves has never 
never been easier. You can learn more about them at bluesound.com or by visiting our website, jazzes.com, where we have put together a Blue Sound Buyer's Guide. All right, real quickly, want to get into the five spots, just five things I happen to be digging at the moment. Um, one is weekly live concerts by the Global Music Foundation. Uh, so this is a really great organization. They are putting on concerts, 30 minute long concerts. So they're brief, you know, nice and brief, followed by a Q&A session with the performing artist. Tomorrow's is by pianist uh, Randy Porter, who's played with uh, Freddie Hubbard, Benny Golson, among others. It's taking place at 3 p.m. Eastern time via Zoom. You got to register an hour and a half before the concert starts uh, and they'll send you the invite. So very cool. Number two is our very own vinyl watch article. Um, we put out these articles every month. And let me pull up the vinyl I want to talk about here. Um, all the exclusive vinyl releases coming out for the month. Uh, you, you definitely go check it out. New stuff by Flying Lotus. And especially one I'm really interested in, this uh, Jazz and Lincoln Center uh, new vinyl release featuring the music of Wayne Shorter. And includes Wayne Shorter playing on it himself. Uh, it's a really great album, and of course, it's even better on vinyl. So go check out that article on jazzes.com. Uh, number three is the news that Eddie Henderson, trumpeter Eddie Henderson, will be releasing a new album in celebration of his 80th birthday party. It is called Shuffle and Deal, and it features a reunion with Eddie and pianist Kenny Barron. It's coming out July 31st, and uh, man, just look how good uh, Eddie Henderson looks on that album cover. You know, looks amazing for a guy in his late 70s. His secret, I think, is that he used to be a professional figure skater. A lot of people don't know that. Um, anyway, number four is news that Grammy Award winning pianist uh, and NEA jazz master Ramsey Lewis, you know him from his hit song, The In Crowd, will celebrate his 85th birthday uh, in fitting fashion with a digital program available to audiences worldwide beginning May 30th and uh, streaming. Beginning May 30th, streaming ticketed solo performances will occur once a month, uh, and Lewis will provide audiences with an exclusive concert experience streaming on the platform Stage It. So you want to be part of the in crowd? This is how you do it. Go to Stage It. That's the platform, S-T-A-G-E-I-T, -E and search for Ramsey Lewis. You'll be able to buy tickets to this thing. Should be really cool. Um, all right, Friday, the fifth spot in the five spot we'd like to reserve for artists that submit through our independent track program. And uh, this one is... Uh, by the bassist Nicholas Krolak. Nicholas is a super innovative bassist and just creative musician out of Philadelphia. And his latest album, Voice Equals Power, totally has that Philly feel, which is about to say, you know, it's rooted in groove and soul and the straight ahead tradition, but totally pushes the boundaries in terms of composition. It's really good. You can check it out uh, on our site, on our inside track page. When you browse albums, search for Nicholas Krolak um, and give it a listen. I think it's really, really good. All right, that was the five spot. It's time now to bring in uh, our resident authority on all things jazz and film, Mr. Matt Micucci, our online editor. He's going to be sharing some uh, times that jazz musicians acted in films and did a pretty darn good job. Matt, are you there? Hello, everybody. How hey, are hey, you man. doing, Brian? How's it going? Good, man. Good. Very good. I, it's always nice to hear from you. Your Irish brogue always lifts my spirits. <laughs> and uh, we should mention, you really are I. You really are kind of a, uh, a resident film expert, because in addition to doing this stuff for Jazz Is, you're all over the film festival circuit, recording podcasts, talking to directors. Film is really your bag, man. I, I Yeah, that's right. Uh, by the way, I'm coming to you live in Technicolor. Uh, I should specify. Uh, it's, yes, it's I also I even studied film, so uh, definitely. And and the best thing about uh, film school, actually, I found to be the libraries, where 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 I read more than film stuff. I read about all of the arts, but for sure, film and music have been like my, the two major passions in my life, and I'm happy to be uh, actively involved in both fields. And I'm uh, looking forward to talking about uh, the subject, the topic at hand for this show. Totally, man. Last Film Friday, we discussed just some essential jazz films, some of my favorites that we thought people should go out and just binge watch over the weekend. Here we're going to be talking about jazz musicians that had starring roles in films. Um, and uh, you're going to walk us through five, I believe. So to kick things off, uh, what's number one? Who, who's the first actor that, uh, you know, is on your list? Well, as usual, these are not obviously in order of preference or anything like that. Um, so the first, the first one is Dexter Gordon, and I, but but in fairness, 
uh, within this list, I'm sure that many will agree. This is probably the best, <laughs> the best performance by a jazz musician in a film. And he actually has the leading role in Round Midnight from 1986, possibly one of the most beloved uh, jazz movies. And not talking about documentaries. This is a proper uh, fiction film by Bertrand Tavernier, who's a French director, a uh, very prominent French filmmaker, and obviously a jazz lover himself. And this is a fascinating film that I'm sure many of you will will be familiar with also because of the original score that was written by Herbie Hancock, who actually appears in the movie. Uh, he's part of the band. Actually, maybe you can actually see him in that image. I'm not even sure. But uh, yeah, this is one of the great films. It's set in the 50s and it really explores the French jazz scene. And, we, and anyone who's familiar with jazz history, obviously Paris uh, was uh, and still is a huge spot for jazz. Lots of players would travel there. And so that's kind of the 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 art it explores, as well as the sort of uh, romanticized figure of the ja down and out jazz man struggling with addiction, which uh, we're going to be seeing again throughout this list too. That's right. This was the film that uh, kicked off my jazz movies to binge list as well. Oh. Uh, Dexter was so good in this movie; he was nominated for an Academy Award. Um, yeah. And yeah, this is just a movie that gets everything about jazz absolutely right. The most authentic I've seen. So, uh, good way to start off the list. All right, what's next, Matt? What's number two? All Who right, so for? this is this is different because uh, we go from a leading role to a supporting role. Obviously, the jazz musicians and movies would have been more in the supporting roles. And uh, of the earlier ones, uh, this one certainly is one that stands out. Uh, also because uh, Dooley Wilson uh, is probably more known by film fans than jazz fans, uh, to be honest. And uh, he was the one who was in Casablanca in 1942. Uh, everyone is familiar with Casablanca. It's like one of the ultimate film noirs. Uh, and he, of course, was the guy who was sitting at the piano and uh, delivers the pivotal song in the movie as time goes by, which, interestingly enough, he wasn't able to commercially release because at the time there was a musician strike, as far as I understand it. So he never actually released it. And the version that he plays in the, in the movie however, remains possibly the ultimate version of that song. A uh, little bit about Dooley Wilson. Not that famous uh, before he actually appeared in this movie, and possibly this is the the his uh, you know the 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 moment that he's most remembered for. But he was a drummer and a vocalist in the twenties in London and other places like that. But really, it's in the movies where he left his mark, and again, definitely in Casablanca more than any other films. That's right, playing Sam, right, and giving birth to yeah. the I believe it's misquoted line. Misquoted, yeah. Right, played again, <laughs> played against Sam is the way everybody remembers it. What was it actually, Matt? It's said in a couple of, of ways, but <laughs> never in the way that people right. always quote. <laughs> right. Oh well. Play it one time, you know, things right. like that. They never actually say it. Play it against Sam, but that was the title of a of a movie written by Woody Allen and starring Woody Allen, but not directed by Woody Allen. Uh, strangely enough. That's right. Weird how our collective memory uh, tends to confuse things. All right. Yes, yeah, an iconic right. role for Julie Wilson there. Okay, number three, Matt. So I, I, I'm not even sure if in the video it's number three, but I'm just going to go ahead and keep going with the list. Anyways, it's yeah, we should mention you made a video about this, you know, <laughs> that goes much more in depth. That's available on the Jazz's YouTube page. So. Yeah. It's also much tighter. I feel like, you know, I'm improvising a bit here. And I'll, as usual, I just that tend to go on and on. That's how number three. Too, All right. <laughs> number three, uh, Miles Davis was in a, was in a, basically the leading role in the film. I'm not sure that many people will be familiar with this, though. It, it was released in 91, and uh, it's called Dingo, and it's it was an Australian film by Rolf de Hare, who was probably one of the most important Australian filmmakers, especially of his generation, for sure. And uh, it's also an unusual film for him because it is quite a mellow drama. And what it is, I mean, it's just, uh, Miles, Miles just plays a version of himself, a very, and he basically is a role model to a guy who, you know, finds himself playing for, uh, finds himself hearing him as a child and then just grows up wanting to be a trumpet player or a jazz player. And so he travels to meet him again. I forgot where exactly he travels to meet him again later in life, but the two connect and bond. And uh, it's a nice melodrama released the year that uh, Miles Davis actually died. Uh, but it's, it's strange because this film never really traveled internationally. It's not 
very famous. Although, to be honest, I think that it should be. I mean, there's some really nice music in there. Not the the favorite era for Miles Davis fans, but I still dig it. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I like what he did in his later times. Too. So do I. No, I dig two, 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 and Amandala, and uh, yeah, he was. It was funny. It's not only is it's not his only acting credit either. I think he also yes. did some work on Miami Vice uh, yeah. during that same time period. Played so, a pimp. That's right. <laughs> and Frank that's Zappa right. played a a drug dealer, I believe. <laughs> Oh, thank God for Miami Vice. <laughs> Put our city crazy. On the map. Okay, uh, Matt, number four. I think we're at number 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 four. Yeah, we're at number four. Uh, <laughs> so I uh, so um, Peggy Lee. It's Peggy Lee's uh, the year of her centenary. So it's nice to remember her. Great Thank vocalist, you. contributed vocals to many films. Um, and in fact, Lady and the Tramp, of course, you know, she, her voice is all over that, that Walt well, Disney classic. Also, uh, she was the voice for some actresses in musical films that couldn't really sing that well. But uh, that is some, sometimes it's actually her, her voice that you hear and not the actress. Who like a singing in the, in the rain type deal. They just move that, their lips. And, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, but yeah, but the film that uh, that I wanted to point out was Pete Kelly's Booth, for which she was actually nominated. And here she plays... Uh, Again, the alcoholic jazz vocalist and uh, yeah, alcohol and jazz and movies very much uh, <laughs> one and the same. Very alcohol often. and jazz podcasts too. I mean, hey, this is the happy hour. <laughs> That's true. I, I should <laughs> again. I'm not prepared for it either. But yeah, I mean, she's she's probably the best thing about this film. I mean, the film itself hasn't aged great, but it still is a, a really interesting musical drama. It's called Pete Kelly's Booze. It was released in 1955 and also features Ella Fitzgerald in a small role too. So uh, there's another artist in that film that's worth checking out. I mean, it is about a jazz band essentially standing up to a gangster, you know, but uh, it's a pretty cool film, I guess. Yeah, and as you mentioned, it's Peggy Lee's centenary anniversary. They've The estate has stuff planned for throughout the year, including the release of a great album, Peggy Lee 100, uh, which yeah. was released May 26th on her 100th birthday. And uh, yeah, it's really good. Some previously unreleased tracks on there. Um, all right, number five. Uh, what are we looking at, Matt? Number five? Oh, oh well, you know, this. Okay, Frank Sinatra. And uh, he had uh, a stellar film career. Uh, so it's hard to even just point, like, pick one of the films that he was in that's worth highlighting. Uh, he was actually, in 1953, uh, from here to eternity revived his career because at the time he was very much yesterday's news and he had fallen out of favor with the audiences but also with the press and then he was able to uh, I think Ava Gardner had something to do with him being cast in uh, From Here to Eternity and it revived his career he won an Oscar and then from there on you know his legend just lives on and uh, but the, the film that I decided to highlight here is actually possibly my favorite film uh, starring Frank Sinatra, along with the Manchurian Candidates, as a few. But it's The Man with the Golden Gun by Otto Prem Preminger. And um, it's a great film. And he plays a jazz drummer in it who is a drug addict. Again, we find yeah. the theme of addiction. But uh, <laughs> but it's incredible. It's hard hitting. It's um, it's one of the I think it's one of the better films made uh, around that time that also deals with addiction. But yeah, you and it's still quoted to this day by people, and I've heard it uh, actually uh, referenced by people who actually did go through uh, experienced problems with addiction, uh, in terms of how realistic it is. So it's absolutely hard hitting, very controversial at the time too. But again, Frank Sinatra had a stellar film career, uh, so it was hard to pick. Uh, one specific title. No, I hear you, but you're right. You know, the jazz musician as drug drug addict or alcoholic did become kind of a cliche, a trope during this era. But this movie in particular was one that kind of took it head on and really dealt with it on a very kind of sophisticated, insightful level. So I'd agree. Great choice. And I understand uh, we have an honorable mention as well. Yeah, when I, you know, I couldn't help myself when I made the video because I always thought that Louis Armstrong was just, I mean, I don't know how cinema and the film industry at the time missed out on the opportunity to really use his talents as a showman. Like, just give him a move, a vehicle, a film vehicle for us to just have. 
And I don't believe that he ever had it. Uh, he appeared in movies like High Society, even Hello Dolly, and he had a hit song with it actually uh, in his later uh, part in the later part of his career. But yeah, I mean, and I think unfortunately that has a lot to do with just you know the the way that film industry was in terms of just uh, race representation at the time it was terrible, and that's another reason, and that's also the reason why Dooley Wilson's name was not featured on the poster of Casablanca. So it it was a time when uh, that was a problem, and the fact that Louis Armstrong did not have there's no vehicle where it's him and he's playing a character, and it's just a movie that's built around him uh, shows that uh, sadly. Yeah, well, there he is in Hello, Dolly. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. He was, uh, and some of that ha could have had to do with, you know, the controversy, you know, in the jazz community um, surrounding Louis Armstrong, especially during this time as bebop um, and free jazz and avant-garde were kind of taking shape. People were saying, you know, oh, Louis Armstrong was a little old-fashioned and just kind of hamming it up. So, uh, but yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think he deserved, uh, they could have built an entire movie around Louis Armstrong or several. Um, and that was a missed opportunity. Matt, hey man, this yeah. has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for walking us through these five jazz musicians who appeared in films and, and did a pretty good dang, uh, pretty dang good job. Um, so, hey, let's stick around, stick around for a bit. I want to walk you through the upcoming uh, schedule for the happy hour because I know you're going to be tuning in, but I should remind yeah. you, Matt, we're moving the happy hour into the 8.30 p.m. time slot starting June 1st. And we're going to be kicking off that week with Esperanza Spaulding. She's going to be our first guest in the 8.30 p.m. time slot. That's June 1st. Wow. Uh, Tuesday, June 2nd, we're going to be talking with bassist Carlos Enriquez of the Jazz and Lincoln Center Orchestra. Wednesday, we'll be sitting down with pianist David Benoit. Um, Thursday, we've got saxophonist Kim Waters, who's got a new album coming out uh, very soon. And then Friday, we're going to be wrapping things up with uh, saxophonist Najee. So again, that's all the 8.30 p.m. time slot. We hope you'll join us as we move the show into the uh, twilight hours. But uh, Matt, thank you for joining me. I sincerely appreciate it, man. It's been a pleasure. All right. Have a good weekend, everyone. We'll see you Monday, June 1st at 8.30 p.m. Ciao.